Uh, so this session is on building and adapting curriculum. Um, you know, we all know that hybrid schools pose particular um, challenges or differences compared to five-day schools or even compared to college classes and how you do pacing and, and content and all these things. So our three panelists for this, for this session are uh, Lori Lane from Ardios Academy in Colorado. Lori Lane is the founder of Ardios Academies a parent partnership program in arts and academies for, the, for K through 12th grade students with campuses across the country. She's been involved in education for over 39 years and has taught in various settings. After founding the RDOs in 1998 and serving as the executive director for 20 years, she now serves as head of schools. She oversees curriculum staff, campus director training, and parent education for RDOs. She is the author of Beginning with the End in Mind and co-author of the RDOs Home Companion series an integrated history and language arts curriculum. Lori and her husband John make their homes in the middle of the Colorado Rockies where they enjoy all things outdoors. We also have John Henry Spann from St. John Bosco Academy in Georgia. John Henry Spann has spent the last 12 years working in education as a teacher, coach, dean, department chair, and principal. He currently works at St. John Bosco Academy in Cumming, Georgia, where he's the dean of academics and teaches both history and theology classes in the high school. And we also have uh, Dr. Amanda Bukite, uh, who's from iLead Schools in California. She started her career as a behavioral interventionist while studying to become a speech language pathologist. She's worked in the school system for the past 20 years. She's won worn many hats over her career, including ABA therapist, speech pathologist, assistive technology specialist, and student support coordinator. She served at iLead Schools in one capacity or another for the past seven years supporting students, families, and staff. So please help me welcome our panelists. And we'll start with Lori Lane from Ardios, and here is. Well, I'm glad you're here this, this evening, this morning, this, I don't know about you, but I'm on a different time zone, and I'm not sure exactly where I am or what we're doing, but we're gonna try and get, this, go, get through this. I'm excited to talk about curriculum. It's where I'm passionate, it's where my heart lies, because I think how, you choose curriculum and how you choose to deliver it will either reinforce your vision for your school or it will undercut the vision that you have for your school. And I thought it was so interesting that in the first session we talked about being very clear with your parents when they're coming in about who you are, who you are not. But it's also very important that you are able to have the curriculum and the curriculum delivery styles that also reinforce who you are and who you are not. At Ardios, I'm gonna to talk to you about how um, we've gone through, we've been around since 1998, so we've made a lot of mistakes that we can share with you so that you don't make the same mistakes. Um, but one of the things that we've learned over the years is that um, our mission statement has to have something to do or a lot to do with our, um, our choices in curriculum. Our mission statement at Ardios is to come alongside and assist parents in training up students who are RTOs. It's a Greek word that means fully equipped and thoroughly prepared for every good work. It's found one time in scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And because of that, um, we have come up with different tenets for our, our philosophy in education. And I wanna go through those. We are a faith-based organization, so some of these will have to do with faith-based, but when we're, when we're choosing our curriculum, for us to be a faith-based organization and not have those tenets as part of why we're choosing certain curriculum would mean that we're in opposition we're having uh, philosophical opposition in curriculum. So one of the things that we find that we have um, built our program on, and this is what makes, a tenet is what makes your program different than another program, right? So when you're choosing your curriculum, you're choosing curriculum that sets you apart from another program. One of our tenets is that we have to have a, a biblical worldview of a child. Where did that child come from? Who created them? How are they created? Number two, um, a, a, uh, the biblical principle of individuality. That is um, where God created them uniquely for a unique purpose, for a unique destiny. And because of that, we're going to be 
teaching them uniquely. So our curriculum has to have something to do with that. We want curriculum for us that has a biblical foundation and allows us to integrate that on every level, not just a Bible verse at the top of the page, <laughs> but something where we can take it and we're looking at science through the lens of Scripture. We're looking at literature through the lens of Scripture. All of that's very important to us, and it's going to come into play in how we choose the curriculum. So what I'm wanting you to do is think through the philosophical tenets or the distinctives of your type of education and what makes your school distinctive. And those are the things that need to come into play when you're choosing curriculum. Uh, we want living textbooks, textbooks that come alive. The information jumps off the page so that our teachers can continue to be living textbook teachers. They're inspirational. They know their stuff. They don't have to be scrounging around to try and prepare. They are prepared, and they're living inspirational textbooks. And that has a lot to do with what curriculum we're going to choose. Because we are very heavily based in the arts, and our history and literature, music, theater, and art programs are all integrated historically, the necessity of having beauty and wonder emphasized in every area of our academic program and our fine arts program is absolutely a necessity. So even when we're looking at a science curriculum, we're looking for a science curriculum that takes that moment to go, oh, whoa. Does that make sense? This is yes. And this is no. Does that make sense? All right, good. All right. We also want to have curriculum that allows us to put a place, an emphasis on character and conscience. So uh, we're wanting to raise up leaders for the next generation. And heaven knows we need some leaders with character and conscience. So we're looking for history books that remind us of what character and conscience looks like. We want it so that it's integrated and relational, both integrated between the subjects and integrated with real life. I don't want a dry, dusty textbook. I want a textbook that is integrated with real life and that allows itself to be integrated with other subject areas. I want to teach through principles and leading ideas. These are some of our distinctives, meaning that Yes, it has the details in there, but when my student walks away, they understand the big picture. They can verbalize the big concepts. And last but not least, I want it to have an environment of excellence, but not perfection. But not perfection. Now, when we went through a, a curriculum audit for our school, uh, about 12 years ago, we realized that because we were so integrated, both from a biblical standpoint and from a historical and fine art standpoint, literary, um, we weren't finding what we needed to find. We were studying things in um, time periods, uh, ancient, medieval renaissance, sound familiar? Ancient, medieval renaissance, early modern, and modern. Soon we'll have to have a postmodern, right? But we couldn't find it so that it would integrate the arts like we wanted it to. And so we had felt like we had to come up with our own. And sometimes that's what you have to do. You have to go ahead and come up with your own curriculum. When you do that, that curriculum, or any curriculum that you're auditing, has to meet absolute educational standards that are already out there. These are things that are so important, and as I was writing this curriculum, um, these were things that I learned the hard way. It needs to have a consistent organizational structure. We, as hybrid um, schools or hybrid programs, work with our parents. They don't succeed unless we've got a parent partnership, a strong parent partnership going. But if you choose a curriculum that doesn't have an organizational structure that your parent can hang on to or that can understand, everything falls apart once that student goes home. So in choosing your curriculum, it needs to have a consistent organizational structure. A writing that provides helpful connectives. Remember that your parent isn't necessarily in the classroom with you and the student, correct? 
So there needs to be within that curriculum connective writing that helps them connect the dots, not just the student being connecting the dots. And then an easy to follow chronological sequence or a scope and sequence that goes along with it. Um, in addition, horizontally aligned, of course, because we need to meet national and state standards and vertically aligned. Um, I mentioned that earlier. And then of course, user friendly for teachers, for students, and then parents. I like to think of it, there's a, a verse in scripture about a three chord strand cannot be broken. Um, parents, students, and teachers, they have to be working together. And if you have one that's weaker than the other, you're going to have one that's wobbling down the aisle, right? Okay. So the same thing goes for your curriculum delivery. There has to have a delivery process that reinforces those same distinctives. So we've got the distinctives that I just talked about that we have for RDOs. You have your own distinctives that make your program different than anything else that's out there on the market. Okay, so your in-class delivery has to also reinforce your, um, your program distinctives. For us, because we're talking about, and you too, because we've all heard this this morning in the three that were up here, that individual child, that means that we're going to have to be delivering it in a variety of methods. So we're going to have to take whatever curriculum you choose, you have to have a teacher that can deliver it in a variety of methods so that they're meeting the individual needs of the student. That instructional material needs to, to appear in a variety of formats. For example, not just in the classroom, but whatever LMS you use, whether it's Blackboard or Canvas or Fax, now used to be RenWeb or whatever, um, whatever you use, don't just write out those assignments. Sometimes put it in a video as well you know, explaining the assignment so that when you've got somebody that's an oral learner or a visual learner and they're not so great at following instructions when it's written, put it on there in a video. Or when you're giving feedback to a student, give the feedback in a video or in a voice recording instead. Um, when we deliver math, because we're only seeing them, how many of you use math, one of the challenges for hybrid programs, right? We see them, we don't see them enough. So because of that, we can take it and use maybe a video program where we're being able to stay with them in the classroom, but their parents can see what's going on because of a video program that we're using at home. Um, one thing I wanna just tell you about that we use constantly is the LMS delivery program to, uh, to use as a, flipped, as a flipped classroom so that the, the student and the parent can listen to what's, going, what's being taught online before they come to class. This goes with Bloom's taxonomy, right? So before they even come to class, they're going to have learned and remembered and have a, maybe a basic understanding of what we're gonna be talking about in class. Then when they come to class, I can use the time in class to apply and analyze and take it a step further then they can go home and take it to the last two levels of evaluating and creating. Um, curriculum delivery methods, um, for us, we also do studio days where they can come in and do uh, private tutoring. Some of our third days are like lab days, but they're lab days in all subjects where students are able to come in and do that as well. So where do you go from here? One of the things that we're actually, we're in the middle of right now is a curriculum and an instructional audit where we've taken these distinctives and we've taken these characteristics of a good curriculum and good instructional um, methodology and we've put them into like an audit form and we're having our, our uh, not parents, not students, teachers go through and actually audit themselves and audit the curriculum that they're going through so that they will know where they stand both with the curriculum and then we go back every once in a while and have uh, recommendations of should we update curriculum, should we change curriculum, etc. so that we're doing the best we can to meet our distinctives, our goals as a school 
with the curriculum and the chosen instructional methods that we choose at RDOs. I don't know how to turn it off. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is John Henry Spann. I'm at St. John Bosco Academy, and I apologize in advance. I, had, I woke up with the world's worst crick in my neck, so my posture is off. If my mother or Emily Post were here, uh, I would be, I'd be embarrassed. But any grimaces or anything are not, it's not you. Um, so like uh, Dr. Warren said, I've worked in education for about 12 years. I was a firefighter before that, and I've, I've worked at all different levels um, of, of schools, entirely five-day programs until I started at St. John Bosco Academy about three years ago. I've been a teacher, I've been a dean of students, I've coached football, I was a principal for four years, and I, I loved it. I, got a, I have a great deal of respect for a lot of those schools that I, that I worked in while I was there. I, I, got, I had my BA in history beforehand, and then I got my a master's in theological studies, and then I got a master's in education from Mercer. And I had a great experience at Mercer, but in the past three, four years or so, since my change over to Bosco, I spent a great deal of time trying desperately to unlearn a lot of the things that were pounded in my head in the MED program. Uh, and that's not a knock to them, uh, but I, I currently work as a dean of academics, and I teach history, I teach theology. And so I'm going to focus fairly heavily on humanities today, and if that doesn't apply to you, I apologize. I'm terrified of math. It was the only C I made in college. <laughs> Um, and the only reason I made a C in it in high school is because the football coach was my algebra teacher. Uh, so I want to brag a little bit on St. John Bosco Academy just as a setup here. Right now we've got a waiting list in every grade. We have a strong, clearly defined mission, and we're not shy about saying who we are and the shortcomings that we see in a lot of the five-day programs. I think that our emphasis and our understanding of our mission and who we are and what we stand for and what we're trying to offer as opposed to a reaction to and just pointing at and saying five days, bad, public school at the road, bad, right? I think we're saying we're not not this. We are this other thing, and it is good, and we are confident in that. We know who we are. Um, we're, we're very upfront, and uh, after leaving my previous job and starting at St. John Bosco Academy, the, the differences in how we do things holistically, but from a curricular standpoint as well, are, are stark. I hope right now that you have parents flocking to your school. Um, I hope that uh, they're, they're coming to your school. And I mean, you're, you're here because you have a hybrid school in some way. And I want to just remind everybody before I move forward that the reason they're coming to, to your school is because it is not a traditional school. The reason they're coming to your school is not to look for a different flavor of what's happening at the five-day program up the road. But they're coming to your school because your school is different right? Your school is non-traditional, and that's, that's a good thing, right? I, I said a moment ago that I spent a great deal of my time trying to unlearn what I learned in my MED program, and uh, to elaborate, I, I spent a great time with a lot of people who I have a great deal of love and respect for, the people I work with and the institutions that I was a part of, but most things were, that were done there were done because that's how you do things, because that, that's what traditional education does. And so we're going we're gonna to make these decisions, and we're going to offer these courses in this order, and we're going to structure our, our classes in such a way that uh, everybody has always done it because that's how we do things. And so I enter an MED program, and I'm in this echo chamber of people, and everyone is talking about this is how education works, this is what we do. And then all of a sudden I went to St. John Bosco Academy, and I had a great love for the school. I had a student who was there. I was all about the mission. And I keep raising my hand in meetings and saying, wait, wait, that's not how you, that's not how you do that. And I had a bunch of blank stares. And, um, you know, pardon my French, but like, who, who the hell cares how they do that? Like, well, I don't care, right? From my, from my administrators who I'm working with saying, we, we, don't, we don't care. This is, the, this is a better way to do it. They're coming here precisely because we're not so focused on the way things are done. Um, Doing things because that's how we've always done them is a great way to lose everything that makes your school unique and a great way to drive parents away from your school. And this 100% applies to curriculum and how we as hybrid school teachers and administrators adapt and maintain our curriculum and set ourselves apart from the five-day programs. I, I wanted to entitle my talk this morning, uh, Virtue, Violence, Sex, and Why No One Cares About the Economy of the Roman Empire. And it didn't make it onto the list. And I understand why. It didn't work structurally with the, yeah. I, no, I totally understand it. I thought it was catchy. Uh, but, but more importantly, right, it gets to the heart of a lot of things that are wrong with a five-day program and a lot of things that are right 
with a hybrid model that understands their mission and is attacking it full force. Um, our hybrid schools in a post-COVID world, if your experience is anything like ours, we're filling up with refugees, essentially. People desperate to say, I want not this. I know what I've been with. I know what we've experienced for the past however many years we've been in the five-day program. Public, private, I don't care. And I hate it, and I want to get away from that. And so with an eye to curriculum and to virtue, violence, sex, and why nobody cares about Rome's economy, uh, I teach ancient history. So I, but I want to get into why we do that. So let's play a game. This is a fun game. Show of hands. Who can tell me the name of the Treasury Secretary during the majority of Bill Clinton's first term? <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Robert Rubin. Robert Rubin. I know that because I Googled it in the hallway like 15 minutes ago. Right? <laughs> Now, raise your hand if you can tell me the name of the intern that Bill Clinton participated in sexual or uh, extracurricular activities with in the Oval Office, right? All of you. All of you can probably tell me that, right? Right? And so that, that's not an example I would use in my classroom. Um, but we have a thousand examples like this. Of, of things that are exciting and attention grabbing, and that's what we remember from any given thing, right? I talk about history. So my kids are going to walk away from my class, and they're not going to be able to list the Persian emperors in order. All right? But they are going to be able to remember um, about that time that 300 uh, Spartans spit in the face of Emperor Xerxes right, at Thermopylae. Right? They are going to remember uh, that time that St. Thomas More gets his head chopped off because he won't go along with what the king wants him to do. They are going to remember um, Cleopatra um, sleeping with everybody important and then killing herself with a snake. Right? These things are interesting and they're engaging and they're things that are, are, going to, are going to get our kids involved in class. But more importantly than that, these are things that actually serve our mission. And I'll get to that in a second, but I can talk about Alexander the Great Hellenizing the Persian Empire all day long. Right? I can talk about roads being built and cities being named after all named Alexandria all over the place and cultural exchanges and the change of dress and spices going to ancient Greece that they've never seen before. Cool. I think that's super interesting because I'm a, I'm a grown man with a degree in history who like watches Civil War documentaries for fun. Right? My kids in class don't. Right? They don't find that exciting or they don't find that interesting unless I'm coupling that with things like the carnage and violence and arson and all that goes into the conquering of the Persian Empire. And I promise I'm going to bring that to a point, but I, I, I want to say first, we cannot teach kids just for the sake of teaching them. Right? We are failing and actively hurting our product, which is our education that is different than the public school if we teach our, our kids things because they're supposed to know this stuff, right? We have to be able to answer the question of why do they need to know this stuff, right? I, fer I focus on things like virtue and sin because they're interesting. And they're interesting because they are relevant and they speak to the hearts of our students. And I further my mission by discussing these things and using these as avenues to touch the heart of our kids and get into the why of what we're doing to support the mission of our school. Now, I will tell you from my perspective and the perspective of St. John Bosco Academy, I want my students to learn history not because it will help them beat tests, not because it will help them practice consuming and regurgitating information so they can get into a, uh, a, a good college, so they can get a good job, so they can pay into an endowment fund for St. John Bosco Academy and then pay taxes until they die. That's not what I want, right? I want my students, our school, our mission for our students is to help form good people who are going to achieve salvation. It is heaven, not Harvard. That's what I care about. I'm all about Harvard along the way. That sounds fantastic. I'm all about that big endowment fund along the way. But those lessons in virtue and moral stories about sin and debauchery are interesting because they further our mission and because they're good for our kids, right? A lot of you probably aren't coming from Catholic schools. A lot of you probably aren't coming from Christian schools. Uh, and it, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter what the mission of your school is. What matters is that you need to think about it, you need to embrace it, you need to be outspoken about it, and you need to integrate it fully into the things that you're doing, right? Maybe your, maybe your school's mission is just to get kids good grades because everybody's fed up with the public school, but I bet it's not. I bet, I bet nobody here 
when they decided to be a teacher, when they decided to be an educator, when they decided to work in administration, thought, man, I really want to teach kids to get good SAT scores, right? We don't want that. And we get so caught up in those things that are not important to a detriment to our kids and from just a purely bottom line perspective, right, to, as a detriment to our product and our program and what is bringing those kids out of the traditional five-day program into your school. Now, I, I have a pill that probably won't be hard, but might be hard for some of you to swallow. Um, and it's true, right? Your school is really, really weird. Your school is bizarre. It is different. It is countercultural, And that is a good and beautiful thing, right? That's, that's why you're here. It takes a real desire uh, for your mission and a real rejection of a five-day program for parents to decide, I want to go to your school. So I want you to embrace it. I really want to encourage you to embrace it. I want, you to, I want you to think about how you're competing not just against five-day programs. You're competing against dual enrollment. You're competing against online classes. Ever since COVID happened, there's a thousand different offerings. So what makes you different? And how can you show that difference to your students and your parents and your families in two days, three days, however many days a week you are going to have them in class? How can you embrace that mission and put it in their face? Now, I'll give you a couple of examples, and our school has a heavy classical bent, and so I'm going to be coming at it from that perspective a little bit, but I want to tell you a little bit about what we do in class that is different and countercultural to the five-day model uh, and helps reinforce our mission. So the first one, we do a catechism, right? Not like catechism of the Catholic Church, but we call it a catechism. At the beginning of every day, my students stand up in class, and I ask them a series of questions. Questions like, what is a classical education? Questions like, why do we study history? Why do we study ancient Greek and Roman history? What is virtue, right? Um, and then I list some virtues and they define them, right? And they memorize this and yeah, they, it's not the most exciting part of their day. We make it fun, I let different kids lead, we do it in accents, we do it as loud as we can, we do it as fast as we can. But whatever it is, these are the main tenets that I want them to take away from my class. So even if at the end of the day, they know nothing about the Persian Royal Road and cultural diffusion between East and West. They know the things that are most important and that we most care about by virtue of the mission of our school. The second, and this is a big one that I'm gonna to touch on more and more, is depth and not breadth. If you're sitting around and you're looking at the however many standards it is that you're required to cover in your class, there's probably only a handful that actually matter and actually serve the mission of your school. Now, you want your diploma to count, right? So you're going to cover all of these, but it's how you cover and what you focus on that really, really matter, right? Like I said earlier, when I talk about the Battle of Thermopylae and this beautiful story of self-sacrifice and King Leonidas and 300 Spartans standing against, you know, a million Greek uh, Persians, according to Herodotus, and sacrificing their lives for the sake of continuing their civilization and their people, that's cool, y'all. I don't care. Everybody thinks that's awesome. Right? Uh, and that's something I'm going to spend two weeks on. And we're going to have discussions on it. We're going to dig into the nitty gritty of it. And then when I talk about like Silk Road cultural exchange, like, all right, that's a fun like 15 minutes. They had food, you know, olives and stuff. Right? And so we're not going to spend the same amount of time on that because it does not serve our mission. Number three, and this is something I've gone into repeatedly throughout this talk um, ignore what you did in school. Ignore it, or, or what traditional education, right? Traditional educators are telling you that everyone is doing. I'm not saying it's all wrong. I'm saying think about what you're doing in regards to your mission and ask, is this right? Don't take it for granted that I must do X, Y, and Z because we've always done these things. I have to structure my class like this because that, well, that's what I did in high school, and that's what all my all my friends who are teachers who are working in the local five-day school. That's what they're doing, so we should do it too. No, you don't. There's no rule that says that. That's ridiculous. All right now. In humanities, and once again, this is coming from more of a classical approach, in history, in philosophy, theology, lit, whatever you're doing, in the humanities, in regards to your mission, one of the best things I think you can do is get rid of textbooks. Consider that. At least consider it. At least look into it, right? Uh, if I have, I teach 40, two classes of 20 freshmen every year, and if those freshmen can read 700 pages of Herodotus by the end of the first quarter of the school year, your kids can read it. And, you know, it's, it's read. I, I'm, I'm, under no, I, I'm under no disillusion that they're not reading the summaries of some of the things in the sidebar and everything. But what you're doing then is saying, here's the stuff. Here's the information. Here's the, the raw material, the primary sources, not the secondary interpreted sources through some textbook. Now, let's me and you and you, let's have that conversation and we can weave our own mission into this as opposed to having to read it as a secondhand, already interpreted document 
coming from a textbook. And the last one, and this is a big one, I'll finish up with this one. Uh, look through your state's curriculum. And like I said earlier, think outside the box, right? I want to give you an example of how we've restructured the curriculum for my class in particular to align with our mission and at the same time maintain perfect compliance with the state of Georgia, right? So I teach ancient history to 40 kids, two classes. I have them for about three hours a week. I also teach a theology course to the juniors, but um, I work at a Catholic school and I teach history there. So the ultimate goal is heaven. That's the mission of our school, the salvation of souls, right? Um, but in terms of ancient history, I want to focus on the foundations of Western civilization, the importance of Judeo-Christian culture and values, how the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the hinge point on which all of history hangs, right? Um, this is what I'm trying to do through my history course. And there are 15 standards that I'm required by the state of Georgia to cover in order for my kids to get the first half of their world history credit that they need to graduate. We want our diplomas to count. We want our kids to finish and do well, right? So those 15 standards cover everything from describing the societies of India and China, include religion, culture, economics, politics, and technology, to explaining how geography, or explain how geography contributed to the movement of people and ideas, includes Silk Road and Indian Ocean trade. I have to talk about the Bantu migrations. I've got to talk about the Olmecs. I have to talk about a lot of stuff that is not directly serving our mission. So there are, of those 15, of those 15 standards I have to cover, there are four that really speak to what we at St. John Bosco Academy are trying to accomplish, that I can really integrate well into our mission. Those are compare the origins and structure of the Greek polis, the Roman Republic, and the Roman Empire, identify the ideas and impact of important individuals, include Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, analyze the impact of Greek and Roman culture, politics, and technology, and explain the origins and diffusions of Christianity in the Roman world. Cool, I love that, right? So to solve the issue of covering all these requirements and keeping true to my school's mission in two hours of class time and one, or two hours of lecture and one hour of discussion a week, we have to think outside the box and we have to be a little creative. I'm sorry for reading, but I wanna read a quick excerpt from my lecture on Alexander the Great that we did right before uh, Christmas break. It'll take about 30 seconds. After Darius III was captured, Alexander the Great led his army into the Ganges River Valley. This was a major population center on the western edge of Indian civilization. Uh, modern day India slash Pakistan at this time was made up of numerous competing kingdoms. They had been trading with Persia via what would become the Silk Road and sailing through the Indian Ocean. These kingdoms were much smaller than Persia, but still very advanced. They traded with the Chinese to the east, the Persians to the west, and had a similar polytheistic religion that we now call Hinduism. And equally advanced technologies, plus they had freaking elephants. How cool is that, right? And so I do that. And that takes 30 seconds. We might have a few questions, a little, a little longer, a couple of minute discussion. But boom, I just covered three of my 15 state standards, and I can get back to the stuff that actually matters, the things that actually serve my class, actually serve the mission of our school. I can talk about things like, um, should we call Alexander the Great? Great. Why? Let's examine his virtues. Let's examine his vices. Let's look at the things that he does. Things like, is the spread of Western civilization a good thing? Things like, morally speaking, when is violence permissible? I can now double down and have those real conversations with kids that matter and further my mission. Additionally, like I've said a couple of times, on Fridays, it's a discussion day. I kind of lie and pretend like it's tangentially related to the text. In reality, it's things that you ought to know about that I find some haphazard way to tie it to something we've discussed. Things like Western civilization, what it is, why it's important. Things like what are, what are human rights, what do we owe one another. Things like virtue, right? Is this act moral, why or why not? And on those discussions, I have a lot of, on those discussion days, I have a lot of wiggle room, which means if I need to bring up the darn Bantu migrations, then I can. I can throw that in there and still check my box for the state standards. Um, but my overarching message is to really embrace your weirdness. Embrace what makes you different and non-traditional. That is good. That is so good. Embrace that, know your mission, and execute. You are weird, your parents are at your school because you are weird, so don't feel unduly bound by state standards that run contrary. We do have to kiss the ring of the state every now and then, but we can still be true to ourselves. This is so exciting. Love you guys, thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm going to try to use this to have some notes here. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a term called PBL today. My name is Amanda Buque, and I work for I Lead Schools. Oops, sorry about that. So let me talk a little bit about 
who we are at iLead and what we do. We're part of a giant organization called Maker Learning Network. We have over 6,000 students that are enrolled with us across four different states. We believe on focusing on the whole child. Makers value not just academic success in learning, but social and emotional growth that creates our next generation of thoughtful, empathetic leaders. Our hybrid California program supports over 700 special education students right now across five counties. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we stand for and what, our, what ILEAD is. So ILEAD stands for international. It's a multicultural learning. Um, multicultural learning develops compassion, open-minded world citizens. Um, leadership, practicing leadership prepares learners for a lifetime of listening, collaboration, and inspiring. We have entrepreneurship development, working in teams, taking risks, learning from failure, and nurturing that entrepreneurialism. And then we have A for arts, exploring a world through artistic experience, enhances all subject areas. And our last area in ILEAD stands for design thinking. And we're huge on project-based design. So participating in project-based learning leads to meaningful experiences and deeper learning understandings. So I talked a little bit about, in my title slide, about project-based learning being a new curriculum. Well, it's really not a curriculum at all. So we have this quote here that says, learning is an active process. We learn by doing, only, acknowledge, only knowledge that is used sticks in your mind. So we, like I said, we use that term project-based learning, and there's a lot of different acronyms or a lot of different words that we can use or phrases for that. We have problem-based learning, challenge-based learning, inquiry-based learning, competency-based learning, strength-based learning, and pace-based learning, and the big one, play-based learning. So in the traditional school system, I'm going to get up, you guys. I'm like a mover and a groover, and sitting is going to kill me. Um, so in the school-based system, 10% of what we read is what we learn, right? And that's what we're doing. We're reading and we're opening those textbooks in traditional school. 20% of what we hear is what we're learning, and 30% of what we see, we learn and maintain. In the concept of project-based learning, 50% of what you see and what you hear, you maintain. 70% of what we discuss with others, we maintain for long-term learning and growth. And 80% of what we personally experience as a learner, we're going to maintain too. And 95% of what we do that teach others, we're going to remember that long term. So we focus on project-based learning at ILEAD as our curriculum. So we all know that not all students learn the same way. We know that not all learning styles are the same. So learners with needs and without special needs do not learn in the same way. And the inverse to that is they don't all show their learning in the same way either. So project-based learning allows students to take areas that they are passionate about and share and demonstrate that learning in a variety of different ways. Not all learning happens right through paper and pencil, and it doesn't always happen through that standardized testing. So we encourage a lot of different projects for project-based learning. Some of these include a challenge, you have to have a challenge to design, to plan, to produce, or to create something. We look at, what do you want to problem solve? How can you address that problem in a real world context? We teach them to examine controversial issues that are important to them, their homes, their families, and their communities. We look at examining philosophical, moral, and ethical issues. And then we take that and we say, you can also take an investigation of a historical event, a time period, or any kind of national phenomenon. So all project-based learning topics start with something called a DQ or a driving question. So we teach our students to create open-ended inquiry questions to facilitate, yikes, to facilitate their learning. It's what the learner, that's what we call our students, seeks to answer by their learning process. There's a perfect formula for developing that um, driving question. So these are some of the driving questions that our students have come up with this school year. We have how can I pursue a, person, a personal passion to connect and connect it to learning in my career? How can we develop a successful business that will benefit our community? How can we use activism of women throughout history to influence or change our community today? I'm going to skip that next one. I'll talk about it in a second. And how can we use activism and women throughout history to influence her? Oh, I got that one in there twice. Sorry. I'll go on to what's wrong with Harriet. 
So in one of our um, hybrid programs, we had an amazing opportunity with our Make It Learning Network team to come into our fourth and fifth graders this year. And these are students who are in tri traditional independent study programs. Some of them go to campuses one day a week, some go two, some don't go at all. And they came in and did a virtual class for our fourth and fifth graders. And they looked at this kind of fun concept of what's wrong with Harriet. And each of those fourth and fifth graders were assigned as doctors and they got a patient that they had to study and diagnose before it was too late. They had to save Harriet. <laughs> so they had to look at, could they get their diagnosis correct and what treatment they could prescribe. I watched these students over four weeks attend eight to 10 hours of class and they were like, all they wanted to talk about was the digestive system. They wanted to talk about the circulatory system. They wanted to talk about the respiratory system. And over four weeks, these fourth and fifth graders designed this amazing treatment plan and diagnosis for Harriet. I'm also gonna highlight one of our other learners. This is Joel. He's a second grade learner who is passionate about answering the question, how can I develop a business that helps my community? He was a second grader, you guys. <laughs> Joel created Eat Joel's Juice. This learner decided to create a project that it, um, he wanted to improve the health of his eyes. So he created three different flavors of juice, made carrot cake as well. His reasoning behind his business plan was to create something that helps our eyes since most of us spend a lot of time on the computer all day and it's important to keep our eyes healthy. So in this small idea came relevant, rigorous, cross-cultural, and student choice, and he integrated tech, just from the idea of creating something really small. So hybrid programs allow all students and all learners to gather knowledge by actively engaging in real world and personally meaningful projects. So I wanna tie that in to the hat that I wear on most days, and that's student support or special education. So why is PBL good for our special education learners? It's inclusive. Any student, no matter what level they're at, whether it's a mild disability, whether it's a moderate disability or a severe disability, they can do it and they can demonstrate their learning through it. It's inclusive, it's differentiated instruction, it's cross-disciplinary content, it has technology, implementation, collaboration, self-determination. We can embed accommodations and authentic assessment are the key components of this successful inclusion. It creates engaging and dynamic learning environments that are known to support learners in a wide variety of areas with their wide variety of needs. We want to help create and support projects that are inclusive. All of our campuses, whether it's our five day a week programs or our hybrid programs, no matter what level or what need our students have, they're fully included in the classroom 100% of their day. So we support collaboration, differential learning, and we embed our IP goals into learning, and we take risks, and we have fun. So I wanted to look at what does PBL look like when we're looking at IEP goals. When we look at speech and language goals, we always talk about how do we bed social communication? What are we doing for pragmatic language development? And all of those things are essential components of PBL. We look at how do we teach our students to ask questions? How do we teach our students to answer questions? How do we teach them to sequence and follow multiple step directions? How do we increase their conversational abilities, their intelligibility? We wanna build their ability to build conversations, build their presentation skills, provide feedback and self-analyze. All of these social communication skills are absolutely essential in project-based learning. They easily align to your students' annual goals. Now, when you talk about academic goals and creating vocational goals, the list goes on and on, and I just listed a few, but we have areas of reading and writing. Our students create TV commercials or web pages to design and promote something. In math, maybe they can plan a trip to a favorite place, create a budget. In science, they can create a model or a concept and label each part. We can do transition planning, technology skills. Like I said, that list goes on and on. So when we have at iLead, we've had a huge influx of moderate to severe students that have come into our schools. They're seeking something else and they're seeking something different. So we have moved to using what's called the unique learning system for these students and we incorporate that curriculum into our project-based learning. So I just wanted to highlight that a little bit in case you guys hadn't heard about that. So the unique has various grade band levels to choose from. And it goes all the way from uh, preschool all the way to transition, which is 22 years old. The lesson plans, whoops, sorry. 
The lesson plans are based on content standards for every activity. They list how to modify the lesson, whether it's to extend it or to simplify it. And there's fresh and new content every single month based on different themes and areas. And we can search for a large bank of skill specific lessons. Lessons can be taught by using the computer, an iPad, smart board technology, or printing the lessons for those hands-on learners that just need those worksheets. And there's three levels of difficulty to choose from in all of the activities. There's pictures and visual supports incorporated in all the lessons, and monthly lesson plans are done for you, and they're available so you guys don't have to spend time doing those. And then there's also some instructional tips that I put in here for working with those special needs learners. So we want to, I guess I just need a drink, sorry. <laughs> we want to inspire known and unknown skills when possible to build confidence. We want to monitor mood and feedback throughout each of our sessions. And if a learner or a student is not understanding how to do something, we always encourage them to think outside the box. Many times we try to figure out how a learner can and can't do something and what supports we can modify so they can be successful. Even in project-based learning, we're looking at how do we break down those tasks to make them more doable and more achievable for them. We want to present smaller amounts of work to each learner at one time. And again, we want to, want to modify for them. We want to increase our response time. We use the good rule of thumb of three to five seconds or longer, depending on the learner. And we want to use a wide variety of hands-on instruction. So I wanted to wrap up we're talking about some of the work that we're doing at iLead and other ways that we're learning and thinking outside of the box. We focus on social emotional. Five days a week, our hybrid, hybrid learners have access to a program that's called Lunch Bunch. It's 30 minutes a day. It's run by our counselors, where all of our general education students, our home study learners, our special education learners, they get to hop on the computer with their grade level peers. They play games. They engage in different discussions, and sometimes this might be the only interaction that some of our students have for an entire school day. I've watched two friendships be formed for some of these learners, and we identify more social-emotional supports as well during that time. And I just shared what our little flyer <laughs> looks like that we send out to our families. And then next year is a huge growth year for us. I'm really excited about um, some of the things that we've planned and dreamed big about. So we're gonna be having monthly language labs for all of our exploration learners starting in August. We're gonna be covering sample topics like, how do you use a graphic organizer? How do you develop a strong paragraph? How do you build vocabulary skills using content clues? We're gonna teach them how to tell exciting stories, and we're gonna offer that once a month to our grades K through six. And it'll be run by some of our care team members, some of our speech language pathologists, and some of our assistants. We're also going to be starting to um, offer a monthly language lab for our junior high and high school learners that'll run on opposing weeks. We're going to be talking about annotation, how to take notes on your computer, how to build your essay writing skills, and we're going to be covering some social skills curriculum for them as well. And then we're going to implement a brand new story time for our hybrid learners coming this year as well. It'll focus on our kindergarten through second grade learners, and we're going to be creating activities for wordless books. Um, working on writing activities, learning how to write a fairy tale, again, use that graphic organizer, make predictions, identify main ideas, characters, and setting. So each one of these activities will come with a follow-up activity that our parent coaches can use to further develop skills in those areas as well, and then they can use those as um, learning period work samples. And then one other thing that I just wanted to share, because the work has been big and the work has been hard. This is just a list of all of the webinars just this school year that our team has put on for our parents. We want to bring our parents alongside of us. We want them to be able to grow with their children. And to do that, sometimes our parents need a little bit of extra support. So just this school year, we have done workshops. We do them live and then we upload them so they can be viewed by anyone on demand onto our website so they continuously have access to them. So we've done speech and language development milestones. We've done a guide for college transition for parents. We've done encouraging positive behaviors in the classroom and home setting. We've done webinars and live workshops on building handwriting back into the curriculum, 
tips and tricks for fostering effective collaboration, tips and tricks for carrying over communication strategies over the summer, behavior basics, tips and tricks for inside and outside of the classroom, my, leader, my learner needs coping skills, what do I do? Anxiety in children, executive functioning workshops, how to maximize the social development in your child, virtual safety for parents, seven habits for kids, growth mindset, signs of autism in girls, virtual math materials, and fostering success by setting up appropriate learning environments at home. And I didn't even cover the ones that are still going for the next couple of months. And I just have some resources there if you're interested in learning a little bit more about project-based learning. And I love the last one. Um, it's a great article that talks about project-based learning for all and inclusive practices. Uh, you mentioned an LMS. What, what LMS do you use, or did you create your own? No. Tried that. Don't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> highly inadvisable. Um, we use... It was RenWeb, now it's called FACTS, F-A-C-T-S. F -A -C -T -S. It's one of the biggest ones out there, and it, it does integrate with uh, Google Classroom as well. Do you guys use it yeah, too? Use that as well. Yeah, we love it. Thanks. Well, they love it. Uh, anything new I, takes me a little bit longer, but that's because I'm old. So. Okay, well, thank you so much to our panelists.